global population's forecast to go uh, to 9 to 10 billion by 2050. Uh, Middle class incomes are expected to rise in that time as well. So the size of the global food industry uh, is expected to approximately double by 2050. Uh, I think that's all on track, um, on expectation. I think we're living in an era now where that demand is real. Growth into emerging markets like China is real. It's now our biggest trading partner by a long way for Australian food and fibre. So exciting demand side story for Australian food and fibre. China's our biggest trading partner, that's true now and, and almost double the next biggest one. So you would never discount that in any strategy. You'd certainly want to look at China. But of course, there's plenty of other markets in Southeast Asia where we've had either historical long trading links or we've got emerging strong trading links. So definitely you still see markets like uh, Korea, Japan uh, and emerging markets like Indonesia, the Middle East. Um, we'd encourage people to look at all of those opportunities and also don't discount some of the bigger uh, secure markets like uh, the US and Europe. I think the history of Australia has been a low cost producer um, and we've gone into commodity markets. I think that's definitely starting to change and the value of, of higher quality um, packaged fresh processed goods as well is starting to re-emerge as our stronger competitive advantage. So we're not necessarily the lowest cost producer anymore, but we are combining that with value and, and quality. Um, still strongly competing in markets. So uh, I think the trend is towards higher value and and that is playing to a strength of Australia. And I think the consumer is demanding products that are wholly produced, packaged and, and marketed from Australia. So I think that's a strong suit for our country. The key challenge is that we don't rest on our laurels in terms of our quality and safety, and that comes right back to issues like biosecurity um, and also how we manage our compliance and testing systems into the future. We need to stay ahead of the curve and adopt new technologies like digital to make our compliance systems even better. Uh, that will help maintain our very high ranking that we have in terms of um, respect in terms of quality and safety. A recent uh, survey in China found we were number two um, only behind New Zealand in terms of respect for our product. Um, so affordability is still going to be a primary driver. Um, most CEOs say that affordability is still the number one issue when it comes to purchasing food, but uh, as we still have, we still need to maintain that strong suit that we have in, in quality and safety. We're in a pretty unique period of Australian agriculture because a lot of our major industries are quite strong at the moment and that is testament to the fact that demand side is strong and that in, in some cases supply can be is constrained out of Australia. So um, I think uh, this very strong, we still see strong interest in the beef sector, um, emerging interest in horticulture for export as uh, horticulture starts to go into utilising some of the free trade agreements that we have and some of the protocols that we have. All industries in Australia, or most of them anyway, are in a relatively good position. So to look at something at the other end of the spectrum like wool, where wool's been, you know, had some tough times since the late 80s and 90s, but now demand seems strong, prices are much stronger. So across the board, I think there's, there's areas of interest in most um, industries. Uh, but you'd probably say the, the beef and the horticulture sectors are seeing the most interest. I think the great thing about Australia is that it's a, such a huge place and we can grow everything from tropical agriculture, tropical horticulture in the north, avocados and mangoes for example, and in, down into cold, colder climate things like berries, uh, wine in southern Australia. Um, so I think I think the good news is is that 
when you look across everything from the Western Australian wheat belt to maybe the intensive agriculture in Tasmania through to tropical agriculture in the north, our traditional sectors like beef, um, I think we're pretty good in, in most sectors. I think that's a real competitive advantage of Australia is that if you want to invest here, the, you, you know, there is an area to invest in most industries. Our domestic retail structures are also um, solid and reliable as well. Um, I, I know, you know sometimes margin is, is hard, to, hard to get in those sectors, but um, I think well-organised retail structures in Australia are, are also capable of generating returns. I've been on the record a few times now saying that attraction of capital is probably the number one thing I would say. Obviously there is a lot of capital in the world, including in our own super fund industry for example, um, but we've got to be organised as a sector to make sure that we're investor ready and that we've actually got the structures to attract that capital. So going back to the greener pastures study that ANZ did back in 2012, they're saying that there's as much as $600 billion needed to transform agriculture from the baby boomers era into what we see as meeting the 100 billion target that the NFF has uh, set for the industry at the farm gate. So I would say capital is the most important element of, of our success. There's no doubt that uh, since the iPhone was invented in 2007, the capacity of the consumer to be engaged in the supply chain is totally different. They're no longer just at the end of it and sort of integrating with their retailer. They're now across a lot more issues. They're now changing their consumption habits and that's true globally because the, glo the global consumer is now very connected to what's happening in other countries, for example. So they're starting to ask for different products um, presented in maybe fresh form, in some cases it's organic, in some cases it's vegan, in some cases it's just fresh and affordable and high quality. So there's a spectrum there of many, many different needs and requirements, segmented more so than ever. And you know, we'll, I think, be well placed as a, as a sector to start to meet some of those needs. So we have one of the bigger organics sectors, for example. Uh, we have relatively strong, robust safety and quality and we've got the capacity to package into fresh um, formats as well. So that probably that last one is the one where we, we may see more investment going into those fresh, ready to eat um, retail packs. As much as we talk about what consumer want, what, uh, how exciting it is to go into new markets, we still got to think about the real world and what farmers face every day and what food processors, distributors, truckies face every day. So we've still got all those same issues, labour productivity, um, you know, on-farm on management systems, um, access to water, access to labour, ensuring that our um, supply chain is as efficient as it can be, things like automation, um, sustainability, circular economy, reusing waste, reducing waste streams. Um, so all of those things that farmers and operators of supply chain assets have grappled with for years to try and get productivity higher, uh, and try and keep costs down on per unit basis. They won't go away, they're gonna always be there and our operatives will be continuing to look for ways to produce the best product they can at the lowest price. The base position on trade would be that you've got um, you know, global, ubiquitous, free trading rules. So the old World Trade Organization approach of, of reforming across the entire globe and having the best utilization of assets through free trade. So in principle, anything that goes against that is you know, not, not maximizing opportunities globally when you start to get into bilateral agreements and where there's bilateral changes like in China and the US, there are usually winners and losers. And we, in some cases we could benefit from that because 
uh, China or the US is seeking a another source of supply. So I think we've seen that happen with soybeans out of out of South America, for example, where uh, the tariff applied out of the US has now shifted the Chinese towards sourcing out of South America. Um, so I don't think it'll affect us too much, uh, but there could be some opportunities there. I think having a very low interest rate environment, having been around agricultural assets a long time, probably uh, is gonna mean there's more interest in agricultural assets. They are, you know, physical asset uh, with I think long-term upside and hopefully people will look at them as a category with uh, a yield a potential capital gain, um, given that some of the other markets are, uh, you know, like property and and like in, like fixed interest products are going to be a bit harder to get a return. So I want agriculture to keep thinking about innovative structures to attract capital, and uh, hopefully this is an environment where we can actually make some gains.